wanted. Amen? Amen. And I appreciate that, you know, for you to, to uh, make me feel some welcome here this week. I've enjoyed every bit of it. And man, if you come to this all week and uh, you hadn't been helped in some way, I'm telling Amen. you, Amen. Uh, hey, they, they, need to, they need to check you out and make sure you're still, still alive. Amen? Because this is good. This is great. You ain't going to go to anything any better. You ain't going to hear no better singing for sure. Amen. And uh, you're not going to hear any better music. I don't think you're going to be any place more lively. Amen. Amen. I mean, it's alive. And uh, Brother Brown, last night, if you heard that message on the hedge last night, listen. Hey, and the one this morning, uh, the one this morning was great too. And uh, he, he's going to preach again tonight. So you're going to hear some, some real preaching. And uh, I want to thank you, Pastor Bell, for everything, for having me to come. I know you can have about anybody you want to to come and preach for you. I understand that. And so I'm, I'm uh, honored that he would ask me to even be a part of this. Um, and I really am. And I realize that uh, I don't know everything that's been done, of course, but I realize to put something like this on, hundreds of hours, thousands of hours of work and prayer and preparation have been put into this thing. I, I can see that. And I appreciate everything everybody's done from the cleaning and the nurseries and the, the music, the Amen. choirs, the specials, yes, the ushers, the yes. parking lot people, everything. I appreciate everything. And I appreciate your pastor and uh, his burden, his vision, his stickability uh, to stay here, and stay with it through the, through the battles and uh, all of that. And if you're going you're gonna to build a church like this, you're going to build anything, it's going to take... Uh, building and battling. That's right. Amen. Part of the time you're building, your old Nehemiah was building those walls and that crowd had a scaffold in their hand part of the time laying block and brick and they had a trowel rather in their hand laying block and brick and mixing mud and then a spear in the other hand and a sword and they would work a while and battle some. They'd build some and fight some. That's, right. That's the way it church is, the way it is. And we, we ought to, the thing of it is, though, the fighting ought to be coming from the outside and off the inside. If you're, if you're a member of this church, you do everything you can, brother, to just help build it. You don't ever do anything to hurt it. You don't ever do anything to hurt this thing. Brother, you be 100% uh, loyal to your preacher and your church. You be loyal. Brother, two things you can do. You, you may not be talented. You may not be a lot of things, but you can be faithful and you can be loyal. Amen. That's two things you can be. Everybody ought to be that. And you do that. You've got a good man of God. You've got a good church. You've got a great thing going here. And I hope you understand what you've got. Sad to say, many people don't know what they've got until it's gone. That's right, Amen. Brother, you, you, you love this place. Pray for it. Put your all in it. You moms and dads, put your kids in here in these days when uh, the children, listen, uh, all the things going on. Man, you've got a haven of rest here. You've got a haven of, uh, sh uh, of, of safety uh, here, putting them here and under this man of God and his ministry here. You do that. And uh, I'm going to preach to you. Take your Bible, turn to the book of John. And I just want to say thank you. And what a blessing to hear Brother Brown and be on the same uh, preaching uh, program with him and uh, hear him. I'll be honest with you. He's such a great preacher that I get nervous preaching, uh, you know, with uh, great preachers like that. And I've had to do it some and uh, I always get nervous about it. But uh, uh, one thing about Brother Brown, though, uh, me and him's on the same team. And, uh, but I enjoy hearing him preach. What a great preacher. You're going to hear in a little bit one of the best uh, there is, and I'm not kidding. Uh, Larry Brown, in my opinion, is one of the best preachers in the country and, uh, that I've ever heard. So you're going to hear a great one. But I'm going to preach something to you here that I think is neat. You know, this week, your, your whole thing is Faith Harbor Week. And it's to get people to come into the harbor and get in good shape to go back out and do the work. Amen. You know, it doesn't do any good to train and get in shape if you ain't training for nothing. 
You know what I'm saying? You take these people right now, I understand some of the Olympics is going on somewhere. Uh, I, I hadn't seen none of anything. I just know that some of it's going on. Do you know that anybody that's in the Olympics that trains for any type of sport is thousands of hours of, of training. And if it's swimming, they swim for hours. If it's running, they run for hours. They eat right. They sleep right. They, they do everything. But they're, they're doing that in training to win the medal. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you and I ought to be in this meeting this week getting our batteries charged and getting our bruises bound up. Uh, and getting our heart, heart, heart in our heart and all of our burdens and getting everything sort of bound up so we can go back out. You know, when I was a fighter, uh, a boxer, uh, they, you'd fight, uh, amateurs fought uh, uh, three two-minute rounds. And then pros fought three-minute rounds. And you had a minute that you sat down in a corner, Brother Bell, just for a minute. And you had a trainer. Uh, that would talk to you, and then you had a guy that was sort of rubbing you down, give you a little drink of water, and if you had, and put a little bit of grease on your face, you know, to keep the gloves from getting burning you, getting cut over your eyes and on cheekbones and that kind of thing, and just sort of talking to you, giving you some instructions. And they were doing that to patch you up to get you to go fight the next round. Uh, you heard about the fella uh, that uh, Brother Brown, this old boy, uh, went out and he was fighting and this guy said, man, you're going to win this thing. And he got his confidence all up and this old boy went out in the middle of the ring and the other guy literally in the first round liked to beat him to death. He busted his mouth, busted his nose, blood coming out of both nostrils, mouth, blood run outside of his mouth, one eye about swole closed. The guy comes back, the bell rings, he comes to sit down for one minute, you know, to get ready to go fight round two. And... Uh, uh, he, and the old trainer jumps through the rope, starts rubbing him down, said, man, you did great. He said, he ain't laid a glove on you. He said, you did great. He said, go back out. And the old boy stood up, ring, uh, the bell rings. He goes back out, round two. Hey, the other eye gets about laid open over top of it. It's about swole closed. The other side of his mouth busted. I mean, he's just barely wobbling to make it through round two. Comes back, sits down, trainer jumps through, said, man, you did great in that round two. He said, he ain't laid a glove on you. That old boy looked through them eyes about swole gloves, looked back at that trainer. He said, well, I want to tell you something. He said, you keep an eye on that referee because somebody's beating the devil out of me. <laughs> well, you know, if you're going to get out here and do something for God, the devil's going to try to beat the devil out of you. Isn't you know, he's going to do everything he can to, to, to bound, beat you up. He don't care what he uses. Amen. You know, if the devil, if the devil's fighting you, Brother Yoda, he'd knock you in the head with that speaker or that microphone or throw that piano on you or whatever he's got to do. It doesn't matter to him. He's a dirty fighter. Amen. He don't care about blowing. Sir, he'd blow your home apart if he can. He'd ruin your children. They'd do anything they can. The devil is a crook and he'd wreck you and ruin you. And that's why you need a meeting like this to come in and all them scrapes and all them uh, hits and all those things, you come in to get help Amen. to go back out for round two. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Because if we all just come in here and get better and don't do anything, the devil backs off. He says, well, you know what? They're not doing anything. Hey, look at me and I'm going to preach. The, the, the liberal church up the road or down the road that doesn't believe the Bible and doesn't try to win anybody, do you know what? They probably have less trouble than you do, Brother Bell. They got less trouble in the church. And I'll tell you why. The devil doesn't bother them. He ain't going to fight that. Why fight it? Why fight it? It ain't doing anything. It ain't reaching anybody. It's not preaching nothing. Brother, when you got something like this going, man, let me tell you, he sets his sights. He says, if I can get anything, if I can fight anything around this area, I'm going after that bunch. And I'm going to try to beat up their Sunday school teachers, their bus workers, their families, their preachers, their staff. I'm going to tear it all to pieces if I can. And so you come into something like this to say we can keep going, we're going to make it, let's go, and then right. you go back out right. to serve. Amen. Now, Amen. and uh, so I'm going to preach to you tonight on John chapter 4. And thank you for everything, Pastor. John 4, 34. Let's stand if you would. I know it's awfully crowded, but if you'll stand with me. John 4, 34. Uh, these are verses that are uh, familiar verses. John 4, 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye therefore months then come 
cometh the harvest, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. Father, I pray that you would help us here. Lord, to be a blessing tonight, I pray that you'll anoint me and fill me with the Spirit of God. I realize, Lord, tonight my inability, my weakness, uh, Lord, I'm not too worthy to be here tonight, but I sure do thank you that you, Lord, allowed me to cross paths one day with Brother Bell and, uh, dear God, to become such good friends and to be able to preach in this meeting to try to encourage the people of God tonight and to try to motivate and instruct and help. And Lord, bless us tonight. Bless Brother Brown as he comes in a little bit. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I'm preaching to you tonight on this thought. Reach them while you can. Reach them while you can. Folks, look, I don't know when the Lord's coming, but I can tell you this. Brother Bell, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea when Jesus is coming back. And by the way, neither does anybody else know exactly when he's coming. But I know this. He said uh, in uh, John 14, 3, if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. And then uh, in Acts chapter number 1 in verse 10 and 11, he said uh, the angels of God uh, in the, the sky there said, ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. So Jesus said he was coming. The angel said he was coming. And then Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, I'd not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, you saw or not. And he said if we believe that, uh, uh, he said if we believe that Jesus died, was buried and risen again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He said for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So Jesus said he was coming. The angel said he was coming. And Paul said he's coming. And, uh, and, and that's enough for me right there. Amen. That's all I need. And when Jesus himself said he's coming and then he said this, we're to be ready. Amen. And, uh, and if you really believe he's coming, you'll be doing everything you can because I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. There's a judgment seat coming Amen. for believers. Brother Brown, and this ain't got nothing to do with the message, but I want to just tell you something. I believe this. As soon as the rapture takes place, if I understand anything about the Bible, the first thing we're going to is the Bema seat, the judgment seat. Amen. Brother Brown, I can't prove what I'm going to say, but I believe it's going to last about three and a half years. And then the marriage supper, three and a half years. Boy, we get something to go to supper for three and a half years, wouldn't it? <laughs> but you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. I dread that judgment seat. Yeah, you know, I heard Bobby Robertson tell this, and I heard Curtis, I heard Tony Hudson tell it just the other day on a sermon I was listening to him preach. And I heard, done heard Brother Bobby tell it. Preacher, this, I mean, it made me break out of cold sweat. Listen to this. Curtis Hudson had cancer and was dying. And Brother Bobby was up in that area preaching and went by to see Brother Curtis. And uh, went in the house, knocked on the door, and Miss Hudson invited him in. He went back into the bedroom. It was just two or three days before he died. Tony was there. Brother Bobby went back there, and it was the last time Brother Bobby said I'd ever see Curtis and talk to him. He said, I told him I loved him and, and appreciated all he'd ever done. And he said, Brother Bobby, he said, I'll be honest with you. He said, I, I, I know I'm saved. I'm not afraid to die. But I'm afraid of something, he said, of facing Jesus at the judgment seat and have not done anything for God. And Brother Bobby said, but Brother Curtis, you pastored the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, church there in Atlanta. Forest Hills Baptist Church, you pastored that big church there in Atlanta and built a great soul winning church. He said, oh, but Brother Bobby, I know me. He said, I've done so very little. Now, folks, I'll be honest. When I start hearing that kind of stuff, it makes me want to go and grab another gear. And Brother Tony spoke up and said, Daddy, you know, he said, you've, you've done a lot for God. He said, Son, hold on. He said, I know me. You just listen to what I'm telling you. I haven't done nothing. Hey, that was Curtis Hudson. Now, let me tell you something what Jesus said right here to these disciples. He said, Hey, fellas, look up here. He said, Lift up your eyes. You know what the problem of it is, Brother Bell? Is we got a sight problem. We, we walk by people every day and never even hand out a track. 
Hey, I ain't say this, and we've had a shouting time this week, but there's people in this room that listen. There's people in this room and people in my church and people in, we call ourselves fundamental, independent, soul-winning Baptist people. And yet if we ain't careful, we're going to try to get more polish on us then we got power. And we're going to try to get more polish than we are personal soul in it. Now, hey, I, hey, I'm for polish. I ain't got none of it, but I'm for it. I polished my shoes this afternoon. But I'm just saying, I'm not against all that. I, I, I'm against everything being as nice and organized and everything as it can be. But brother, we better not forget the main thing still the main thing. And it's reaching people. And let me say this, Jesus said, he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. You know what the meat was? The will of the Father. What was the will of the Father? That he'd come and die for the sins of the world and reach the world for, for the cause of Christ. And then he said, say not ye. There are four months and then come at the harvest. He said, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Let me ask you a question. Are you looking on the field? Where's your field? Where are you looking? Now, I'm going to talk to you tonight about this thought here. Reach them while you can. Why should we reach them while we can? I'm talking about reaching everybody we can. Reaching everybody we can. We ought to reach them while we can because of the commission of Christ. Hey, you know what the Bible said? Five times. Why is it called the Great Commission? There's a lot of commissions. You're commissioned to tithe. Commission's a command. But tithing's not called the Great Commission. But the Great Commission is called the Great Commission. You know what he did? He mentioned it five times. I mean, he strongly, in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go ye into all the world and, and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, right. teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Then he goes over to Mark 16, 15 and said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then he goes over to Luke 14, 23 and says, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them, plead with them, beg them, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Then he goes over in John and said, Even as the Father hath sent me, John 20, 21, Even as the Father sent me, even so send I you. I'm sending you. Amen. Then Acts 1 8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost part of the earth. That's five times, Brother Bill, in five books of the Bible, five straight books. And by the way, them just places we're just hitting. There's other places in them books and other books of the Bible. Even in the Old Testament, in the book of Ezekiel, Brother Brown, when it talks about bloody hands and it talks about a watchman that does not warn. Uh, Psalm 126, 5 and 6, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Uh, Proverbs eleven thirty: the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He that winneth souls is wise. Then you go to Daniel 12, 3, and they that be wise shall turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Shall shine as the brightness of the ferment. You see, the truth of it is, is this right here. What I'm trying to get to you, folks, tonight is we ought to reach them because of the commission of Christ. We're commanded. It's not an option. It ain't called the great option. It's called the great commission. We ought to change our well, welcome mat out here to a will go mat. Our job is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Then let me say this right here. We ought to reach them while we can because of uh, being conscious of what time it is. He said... Say not there's four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say now. Lift up your eyes now. Lift up your eyes now. Lift up your eyes now. He said, you better go do it, fellas, now. The fields are white now. The fields are white now. In John chapter 9 and verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh. Brother Bell, the night of death cometh. The night of death is going to come to people. 
Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. The night of death comes. The night of lost opportunities. Hey, let me tell you something. Brother, this thing's serious. I had a lady call me last year in our church. A lady called me and said, Preacher, we're in Florida. Her husband was lost. I tried to talk to him. Brother Brown, he was lost. and He was a, a retired police officer for years. That's about all the kind of work he'd ever done. Big old man. I went to see him one time. Couldn't get first base with him. She said, we're in Florida and preacher Tom's got sick. And she said, he's in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, hospital here and they've done some x-rays. He got real sick and they did some x-rays. He has a huge brain tumor that, and, and it's cancerous. They're going to operate on him tomorrow. They're in southern Florida. I'm in North Carolina. I said, can he talk? She said, yes. I said, put him on the phone. She put him on the phone in the, the bed there, and I said, Tom, listen, buddy, I'm praying for you. He said, Preacher, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't know if I'll make it through this. I said, you're going to make it because I'm going to pray that God will help you to make it. Amen. I said, Tom, you better get saved. He said, I know. You better get saved. He said, well, here's the phone. He said, get back to Mary. And Mary said, well, preacher, you pray for him. I prayed with him on the phone. Brother Brown, in a few days, he come home. On that Sunday, when he got to where he could come, he came that Sunday. Sat right back over here, and I preached. I did everything I could to get him saved, but he wouldn't come down the aisle. On that Thursday, though, thank God, listen to this, I, I, I went to the house and sat across the table, and I said, now, Tom, I said, I didn't come here to play. I said, buddy, look. I said, I, I did like a brother Brown about like old Isaiah did. Yeah, amen. I walked in there and I said, hey, man, you better get things in order. You, you, listen, it ain't looking good, Tom. And I, I wish I could tell you different, but buddy, you better get things in order. Hey, his old eyes filled up with tears. He said, preacher, I'm ready. And I give him the gospel. He reached across that table and took me by the hand. He prayed, Brother Brown. He asked God to save him. He had another operation. He came to church for several months there. And preacher, listen, that man died and I preached his funeral. And, and his wife is faithful to our church. And every now and then she'll walk by and say, Preacher, I just want to thank you for coming by and seeing Tom. Amen. I want to thank you for coming by and trying to witness to Tom. I want to thank you. You know what, let's folks, the night cometh. Opportunity. Right over here, uh, Brother Jerry over here. Uh, raise your hand, Brother Jerry. Said, right over here, this uh, evangelist over here. One year we was having this faith harbor. He reminded me about it today. We was having this meeting. And a uh, night like this, a priest on soul winning. And uh, if I remember, Brother Jerry, you went over here and knelt down way over around this corner over here. Was it over here? And came over and knelt down and got up out of here and walked out and was so burdened about his sister and brother-in-law being lost that he walked out here squalling and bawling and got in the car and called her and said, I'm on the way to come see you. Amen. And uh, his, she said, well, you come on, but you know now uh, her husband, she said, he may throw you out, cuss you out. If you come in here, that's about what you expect. He said, I don't care, I'm coming. I'm coming. And that, listen, he drove up into the night, got to their house up in the morning and got in there and got to witness unto them. And listen, he prayed and said, oh God, do something. He was so broken and burdened. They that so in tears. Listen, and that brother-in-law got saved and his sister both got saved. Yeah. Hey, you know what it is? It's time to get your eyes up. Yeah. It's time to lift up your eyes. Yeah. Folks, we better quit playing about this thing. Yeah. The night cometh. The night cometh. And I'm simply saying of what time it is. Hey, we're in the fourth quarter of this thing. Romans 13, 11 says, and that knowing the time. Romans, Paul said, and that knowing the time, that it's now high time to awake out of sleep. Amen. For he said, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. He said, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Folks, listen, the Lord's coming. Amen. Hey, if you're ever going to be a soul winner and get your family saved and get your neighbors saved and get your people around you saved, if you're ever going to do it, it's time to get with it. Amen. I moved into a development here a few years ago. Moved in. Actually, I didn't move. I was in Arizona preaching. We bought a house. 
and my wife and my kids and uh, some of the kids from the Christian school and some other people helped, and they moved while I was gone. Boy, was I glad they moved while I was gone. Man, that was a blessing. Why do you think I took that meeting that week? Amen. <laughs> hey, they moved. Got everything moved. I come back. Everything's just busy all the time like it is around here. I got busy, Brother Brown, and, and really realized one day about two months had passed and I hadn't been in my neighborhood. Brother, hey, come preacher, on. i tell you what I did. I got me some tracks. And I told my wife, I said, this evening what I'm doing, I'm going soul winning door to door in here. And Brother Brown, this is how I did it. I knocked on a door, nice, nice homes, middle class homes, knocked on the door. Woman come to the door, man come to the door, and I said, hello, I'm Brother Cox from Trinity Baptist Church, but I'm also your neighbor. I live right over here on 208 Deerfield Circle. They said, well, good to meet you. I said, yeah. I said, I've lived here two months. I said, really, what I stopped by for is to apologize. And they said, well, what on earth for? I said, because I've lived here two months without coming to ask you if you're saved or not. I said, I've lived here two months and I ain't even been to your door. Would you please forgive me? And they'd say, well, yes. I'd say, well, then, since I'm here, <laughs> and since that's what I'm asking you to forgive me, would you let me tell you? I witnessed to them. I'm simply saying, folks, we need to get serious about this thing. You know, everybody that lives around you, we have a big radius that lives all the way around you. Everybody that lives around you, probably say, that man's saved down yonder. And yeah, I tell you what, he's been to my house. He's come to see me. If you did that, think how many families in Columbus that could be reached with the gospel that you could probably have them in this church. Amen. If they seen that we really cared, I, we ought to be conscious of what time it is. Reach them while you can because the commission of Christ and because of what time it is. Number uh, three, uh, reach them while you can because of the chances of death. It's coming. I'm telling you right now it's coming. Hey, listen, right here is a picture of a boy that rode one of our buses named Ephraim Gutierrez, little Mexican boy, about 13 years old, little old Ephraim. He rode Eddie Bodford's Sunday school bus, Lexington bus, rode the bus and come in, Ephraim did one Sunday, and heard me preach Brother Brown, and he got saved. We baptized him, and he got coming faithful. Listen, I wish you could see where that little fellow lived. It was the most pitiful thing I ever saw. It wasn't fit for anything to live in. He lived there. He was as happy. He came every Sunday. Preacher, he come in out the door every Sunday. He never did like a lot of them and just go around the preacher and go out the other doors. He wanted to shake my hand every Sunday. Listen to this. He had always come, and, and he'd hug me. And he said, Preacher, guess what? And I said, What, Ephraim? He said, When I get older and I get up to an adult, he said, I, I, must, he said, I believe God wants me to preach. I said, Well, good. He said, I'm going to pastor a church and I want to be just like you. Amen. Boy, I tell you, yeah. Brother Bell, I have turned my head sometimes. Amen. I mean, listen, I mean, it'd get to me. He'd say, Preacher, I'm going to be just like you. I love you. I'd say, I love you too, Ephraim. Hey, Brother Brown, one day he was sitting at his desk at the middle school in Lexington. Brother Bell, they said he grabbed his head, let out a cry, tumbled into the floor, and was dead with a brain aneurysm before the 911 people could even get there. He was dead. He was already dead. A little buddy. Hey, you know something? I carry his picture hey. everywhere I go. There would have been one of my little preacher boys. Hey. But you know why? Let me tell you something. We reached him while we could. Hey. Son, I didn't know at 13 that little boy would be dead. I didn't know he'd be dead. He looked as healthy as he could be. He didn't look like there's anything wrong with him. But let me tell you something. He died. I just thank God we reached him. Amen. I just thank God Brother Eddie Bodford knocked on his door one day and reached him. Amen. Little old fella got saved. We baptized him. Hey, death's a coming. 
Oh, reach them while you can. We had a fella by the name, uh, listen, uh, by, by the uh, name of Mike. Old Mike had been a motorcycle uh, gang. I'm talking about tough, man. Tough as could be. And Mike had a freak accident, broke his ankle. He got saved at our church. I baptized him. He had a freak thing and broke his ankle, and his ankle never did heal. I really believe it was because he didn't really get much treatment at the hospital. Long story short, Mike died. I preached his funeral. Hey, do you know something? Though? I'm so glad we reached him. He rode my bus. God bless his heart. Hey, I'm talking about on and on. I could go on and on with people. I'm thinking about old Philip Morris, a guy named Philip Morris. Brother Larry, I was out one day uh, on the bus route, and, and, and a little old boy was in one of these motorized wheelchairs. It was out there uh, on a parking lot, and I seen him, and I pulled up beside him in the car. I said, hey, buddy, you're new here, aren't you? He said, just got here. Housing development. Just moved in. He said, right up yonder is my daddy. I said, well, hey, you go to church? He said, no. I said, can we go up there and talk about it? Let's go up there and see your dad. And he said, yeah. Went up there, Brother Bell. There was a guy sitting there smoking a cigarette, had on a pair of gym shorts and a tank top and flip-flops, shoes, sitting there in a chair smoking a cigarette. I got out of the car, walked up, and I said, I'm Brother Cox. He said, I'm, that boy said his name was P.J. Morris. Walked up, man stood up, shook my hand, said, my name's Philip Morris. I said, man, I've heard of you. <laughs> He said, I wished I had a dollar for every time somebody said that to me. Philip Morris. I said, your real name? He said, real name, Philip Morris. I said, Philip, you just moved in. Your son said, he said, yeah. He said, our trailer burned down. Lost everything we had. I said, I'm sorry to hear that. He said, everything. He said, this is everything I own right here. He said, the, 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 the uh, county put us in this little apartment. He said, we ain't got nothing. I said, well, let me ask you a question. If you died right now, if you would have died in that house trailer and burned up, would you went to heaven or hell? He put that cigarette out. He said, I'd have went to hell. That little boy in that wheelchair said, me too. There was about that time the door busted open as a girl come out about 11 years old. Her name was Deidre. She said, I wouldn't go to hell. I'm saved. She said, I got saved at junior camp last summer. I said, well, I'm glad, Deidre. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. I led him to Christ. I said, Philip, would you come to church tomorrow? He said, preacher. He said, I, I don't have any clothes. He said, everything got on. I said, stand up. Brother Brown, he stood up. Me and him was the same height. We looked like we weighed about the same. I said, hey, I, I said, what size shoe you wear? He told me. I said, look, I think I can fix you up. I went home. I, got, I cleaned out my closet, man. I got everything I could get. I got two or three suits. Ties, belts, shirts, socks, everything, shoes. I got on the phone and I said, to My wife, I said, Who, who that little boy? I said, Who, who you think? She said, Miss Johnson, Marlena's boys, William. I said, that, that, that boy's about the size of William. I said, Marlena got a little cripple boy over here in the wheelchair and I said, They got burned out. I said, You got any clothes? I need some clothes. She said, Oh, yeah, we got a ton of clothes. Hey, went down there, Brother Bell got him a suit. Next morning, I rolled in there at that old bus, Brother Brown. I rolled up that old bus, and, I, and they were sitting on the front porch. And he had a, a wheelchair that just folded up. And I went and picked that little boy up with my arms and picked him up myself and carried him. I thought about old Mephibosheth. And I picked him up and carried him, and his daddy walking along behind me, and I set him up in the bus seat, and his dad sat up there beside him, and that dad had on that suit. Listen, he looked like a, he looked like a lawyer. Man, he is, he is all fixed up, and that little boy's all fixed up. They come that morning, I preached, they sat right down here, listen to me, and uh, walked down the aisle, made it public, got baptized. This is what I'm going to tell you, though. About two years later, that man was coming down the road, had a car wreck. Put him in a hospital for a few days. Sent him home. Thought he was all right. Had a blood clot. And when laying asleep on his couch, a man laid right there on his couch and died from a blood clot. Went to his heart. 
Boy, I'm glad we reached them while we can. Amen. Now, let me tell you something. I don't want to lead you to believe we're reaching everybody we can because we got some people that listen, wouldn't turn their hand over to get nothing done, but I got a bunch of good ones that's going after them. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. Brother, uh, you ought to get with the program tonight. If you're, you're a member of this church, let me tell you something tonight. It's good to get help. It's good to get encouraged. But let me tell you, friend, you don't get encouraged and get help to not do anything. Hey, we're saved to win the lost. And I'm simply saying, hey, reach them while you can because of the chances of death. Let me say this right here. Reach them while you can because compassion makes a difference. Amen. Hey, you know the difference in this church right here and liberal church up the road? One word, compassion. Oh, but you said if you heard George Bell sometimes you'd think compassion. If you heard him getting up here getting on us about standards and sin and all that. Hey, do you understand something? That right there, that is compassion. Amen. That somebody that loves you enough to warn you about sin, you better thank God. Amen. But you know what? These old blue and white buses, they blue and white. And by the way, they're beautiful. They look good. Mine's all still just yellow and black like, you know, the school. But they'll allow us to do that. Them beautiful buses I was looking at when we pulled in. But you know what? If I was looking for a church and I drove by and seen them old buses down here, down here, I'd say, I believe that's it right there. Amen. You know what that says? Compassion. Compassion. Hey, reach them with compassion. Love people. You got to, hey, you got it, It's all about just loving people. Loving them, caring about them, having compassion. Hey, years ago, you know that we, uh, uh, this is something I ain't telling you to do it. You do what he tells you to do. I'm just telling you what we've done. Brother Brown, years ago there at Trinity Baptist Church, me and Marilyn was on a bus one Sunday morning in Lexington, and a little uh, boy, and uh, two little boys and a little girl jumped on the bus. They'd moved from Duluth, Minnesota. And we had tried to reach them. We got the mom to come a few times to church, but we got, got this family a coming. And uh, these kids was coming, and they was riding the bus on a Sunday and this little boy got on and sat down in the seat and he got to crying. My wife went to him and said, Jamin, what's the matter? He just shook his head. He wouldn't tell her. She went back in a minute and said, Jamin, honey, what's wrong? Just shake his head. After a while, she kept saying, Jamin, what, what's wrong, buddy? And then in a little old low voice, he said, I'm hungry. Now, buddy, when you're, when you're so hungry, you're crying over it, you're hungry. Brother Bell, she come up there and I was driving that old bus and she said, and I said, what's the matter? She said, he's hungry. I said, when we get to the house, the passenger's right beside the house. I said, when we get to the church, you take Jamin and Samantha, and I don't remember the other little one's name. It's been years ago. I said, you take them over to the house and you scramble up some eggs and bacon and some toast. Amen. Just hold them out of Sunday school. You fix them something to eat. You, and I said, I don't care, bless God, if they eat a dozen eggs. I don't care what they eat. You fill them up. You fix them up. Amen. And then you bring them on in for preaching. And she took them over. Brother, may I tell you the truth? It bothered me so bad all day uh, thinking I wonder how many I got coming in here hungry. And I said, I'm going to do something about this. And I put me up a little building that just looks like a little shanty nearly. I've covered it now. It looks a little better now with siding and all. But I put me some freezers in there and some refrigerators and some stoves and I got me a crew of women and I said, look what I want you to do, ladies. We're going to buy the meat, the hot dogs, and we'll buy the buns and we'll buy the little Debbie cakes. We'll buy cookies and cakes and, and all that. And, and, and look, let's, let's do this. Let's feed them because we don't know how many we're bringing in Amen. that might be hungry. And folks, now, I wish to God I knew how many uh, hot dogs that we'd fixed. Hey, I ain't talking about thousands. I'm talking about hundreds and thousands and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And every week I got somebody come out there at the clipboard and said, how many did you have? And if we had 100, they'll put 140 hot dogs on there because let me tell you something. We've had kids that big eat five or six of them. Hey, and they wasn't trying to be cute. They was hungry. Hey, but you know something? Listen, we've bought shoes. We've done everything in the world. Like you have around here, I've bought shoes. We've bought suits. Uh, listen, I've delivered on Christmas. I've, listen, we've delivered. And I mean not just Christmas. We've got a food pantry trying to help, listen, reach them and help them. 
do everything I can to help them. You say, why? You know some. You say, well, preacher, I just don't know if all that's necessary. Well, you know what? One day Jesus preached to a big crowd, Brother Brown, and it was getting up in the day, and the disciples, he said, uh, Jesus said, they're, they're hungry. And, and the disciples said, well, you, you have to send them away. He said, oh, you can't send them away. And here come one of the disciples said, here's a little old lad who's got his lunch. Jesus said, boys, set them down in companies of 50. And set them down, and let's organize this thing. And you know what I did? Jesus looked up and prayed and asked God to bless it. And when he, them disciples started passing out fish sandwiches, hey, when they finished, everybody ate till they were full. You know what? Hey, you know what this? Listen, he had compassion on them. Hey, you know the man that started the Salvation Army, old General Booth? You know, his, his, his thing was soup, soap, and salvation. He said, you can't tell a man about God if he's starving to death. He said, give him something to eat and then tell him. Amen. 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 But I'm just simply saying, I ain't just saying, well, it just turn into that. I'm saying, though, whatever you got to do, whatever you got to do to reach people and get the gospel to people and help. And I know, listen, I know all about that stuff about the sorry, a lot of these sorry moms and daddies. They wouldn't work in a pie factory if they could taste every pie and come off assembly line. These people are so sorry, it's pitiful. Amen. And they, they, but, but you know what? Hey, them little old kids can't help it. Right. Right. Amen. They can't help that. But I'm simply saying let's reach them while we can. Amen. Then let me say this right here. Reach them because, uh, while we can listen because of the casualty of sinners. Hey, where sinners is going. Amen. Hey, do you still believe there's a hell? You know something uh, that bothers me, uh, Brother Bell? It really does. It bothers me. You know what? You could, you could probably visit a hundred independent Baptist churches and visit one uh, for two years every Sunday morning, go all over this country, and you'd never hear a sermon much about hell anymore. You know why? I think, uh, Brother Matt, we've moved beyond that, that we just think everybody knows about it, and let's just not bring it up. But I'm simply saying, if there's a hell tonight... If there is a hell, would you pray tell me something tonight? Why uh, on, on Saturdays when I'm out on the bus route that I'm having to wade through the Jehovah Witnesses but don't never bump into a Baptist? And I see them old Jehovah Witnesses out there and they look like fundamentalists. Them little old girls out there in their little pretty uh, uh, dresses and the men out there with nice haircuts and white shirts and suits on with their briefcases walk around. Well, they don't even believe in hell. And yet, you know what? There's a bunch of fundamental Baptists out there in their Bermuda shorts washing their Jaguars on Saturday. Or out there, and listen, and here's the world going to hell. And listen, and we, listen, we got tracks down at the church. We got vans. We got buses. And on Saturdays, we're piddling. We're at the mall. Yeah, come on. We're, we're in a boat somewhere down on some lake on Saturday and some Jehovah Witness, it's a, so crooked when he dies, I have to screw him in the ground, he's so crooked. Amen. His doctrine is off a thousand percent. He don't even believe in hell and he's out there sweating like a pig, knocking on doors, handing out false tracks. And here we are that say we believe there is a burning hell with brimstone and fire and yet we never knock on anybody's door. Oh, let me tell you something. The casualty of sinners. A man ought to read Luke 16 where an old boy uh, died. It said, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in these flames. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, and now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, he said, there's a great gulf fixed. So that they that are hence can't pass to us and, and we can't pass to them. He said, nay, Father Abraham, if somebody went back from the dead, if somebody went back from the dead, and, and, and he said this, I have five brothers. Right. Tell them don't come to this place. Right. Send somebody back from the dead. And you know what Abraham said? They have Moses and the prophets. Preacher, you know what they're really saying? They got George Bell. They got Daryl Cox. They got you, son. They got you. They got you. They have you. 
They got you. They have you, preacher. They got me. They got you, choir. But what are we doing? Last week, I buried a guy named Curtis Cole. This happened last week. About a year and a half ago, I was coming out of, out of the hospital and was walking down the sidewalk and this woman standing on the sidewalk. I said, hey, ma'am, let me give you this, tell you how to stay out of hell. She took it and looked at it. She said, I ain't going to hell. I'm going to heaven when I die. I said, well, good. I said, you've been saved. She said, yes, I have. But she said, my boyfriend ain't. His name's Curtis. said, he's up there in room 440. She said, can I take this and give it to him? I said, yeah, take it. Brother Brown, that afternoon, about two hours later, I was still out visiting, got a telephone call from Mary. The secretary there said, preacher, there's a man named Curtis on the line from the hospital and said, he's a crying. He wants you to come by there. said, you give his girlfriend a track. I went by there, Brother Bell. He was in the room. He'd been laying there reading that track. He said, would you please explain this to me? Amen. I let old Curtis Christ... The other day, he was dying, and, and listen, he said this. He said, Preacher, it's probably the last time I'll ever see you. I walked out of his room, but he said, hey. And I was going out the door, shutting the door. He said, hold it. I turned around and looked, and he said, I just want to say thank you. Amen. Amen. He said, the next time, Preacher, we see each other, probably be in heaven. Amen. He said, thank you. Hey, I went by my wife's witness. It was Thursday. It was the next day. I said, I'll see you tomorrow. I went by. It was Thursday night. Went to the hospital. He was already out of it. I went by Saturday morning. No, that was Tuesday. On Wednesday morning, July 4th, I went by the hospital that morning. When I walked in, that bed, there's nobody in it. A nurse was coming up. I said, ma'am, let me ask you something. I said, Curtis gone? She said, yep, he's gone. Brother Brown, this thing's real, buddy. Amen. Reach him while you can. Can I read you this? And I'm done. I'm through. You're going to hear a real preacher. Listen to this. I'm going to leave this with your pastor. So if you want copies of it, you can have it. This is called Through the Eyes of the Bus Worker. Some see a fight, a push, and a shove. I see a desperate one crying for love. Some see a brat. He acts a bad. I see a boy who's never met his dad. Some see the messes and the troubles they give. I see the poverty in the places where they live. Some see a teenager who doesn't dress right. I see a girl who has to protect herself at night. Some see a smart mouth, disrespectful and loud. I see a kid who's always made fun of by the crowd. Some see a woman who j comes just to use. I see a lady by a drunken husband abused. Some see a drug addict withered and worn. I see the soul of the Lord once reborn. Some see the dirt, the filth, and whatnot. I see a kid who without Jesus doesn't have a shot. Some see a crook who they don't trust that much. I see a man who needs the Lord's touch. Some see a bunch of heathen who holler and yell. I see kids who have parents in jail. Some see a teenager who gives a lot of flack. I see a young person whose parents use crack. Broken homes and broken lives, those without hope. They need compassion and God's grace to cope. For every little girl who lies... Awake hungry at night. Lord, help me to stay in the fight. For every scared boy who sees his mama get hit, Lord, help me to be faithful and to never quit. For every mama who needs a new start, Lord, help me to show her how to ask you into her heart. For every man on whom sin has a hold, Lord, help me to make sure the gospel story is told. Lord, to me, your mercy you have shown. Now help me to reach out so others may make heaven their home. May others judge gently when these folks see, if not for God's grace, that's where all of us would be. Amen. Let me ask you something. What's your eyes see? Making money? Just the world? Or Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look on the field. For they're white already unto harvest. Our Father, I pray.